Okay, good evening everybody and thank you so much for coming late at night uh, to, uh, to see us speak. Uh, so this, despite the slightly different title that is on the slide, is indeed the talk about smart metering privacy. And uh, I was actually perusing the web pages of OWAS Belgium and I saw that we're not allowed to have corporate logos. I wasn't quite sure if my university logo actually counts as a corporate logo since we're actually a charity. So I settled for just dimming it down to 20% gray from its original black and I have done that for all the other logos that I have uh, in there as well. So. I am Jordan Nezes. I usually teach at University College London and uh, I work on security and privacy engineering. Now, security and privacy, um, and in particular cryptography in that context, is known to be good and very well, very good for one particular thing, okay? And I hope my images are going to show here. So let's imagine that Alice and Bob, since, you know, we're going to be talking about cryptography, love each other, okay? They are in love with each other. And no normally I should have seen Alice on one side and Bob on the other side there, but somehow we only see the communication between Alice and Bob that are sending a message to each other. I'm not really sure uh, if we should fix that or not. Anyway, let's hope that not more uh, graphics are going to be missing. We're just transferring the, the talk. Okay, so, and if basically Alice and Bob want to talk to each other secretly, they trust each other, they you know, they know that each other are not going to betray their secrets, they can use a whole host of security technologies that are very well established, okay, to communicate secretly from third parties, okay? So they can use TLS if they use a web-based uh, platform to communicate, or IPsec if they use IP, or off-the-record messaging, Tor if they want to hide the identities, their identities from each other, etc. right? Um, and this way, this mysterious, illusory, like not actually seen, Alice knows that she can talk to Bob, which is on the other side that you cannot see, uh, in secret. So this is called in cryptography a secure channel. And to some extent, it is the success story of cryptography. Okay, cryptography was invented to build secure channels. And to some extent, it is pretty much the only thing that we believe that cryptography, at least in theory, can do well. And I say in theory because sadly, what we have seen in the last six months is that even those secure channels are in fact not really robust against state level adversaries. Okay? We have seen revelations that you know, the NSA and GCHQ is really in the business of actually piercing through these security channels, not always by breaking the cryptography, but by doing all sorts of funny games around you know, certificates, non-certificates, bugs, platforms, etc. Okay? So we have reduced the security of um, the secure channel, usually to the security of the platform or the web platform or whatever is being used. Okay. However, I am concerned today about a slightly different and much, much, much harder problem. So imagine that we don't have any more Alice and Bob who just love each other and trust each other implicitly, but instead Alice is a homeowner, okay, and Bob is actually an energy company. And in the UK the energy companies are private, hence, you know, the kind of dodgy looking, capitalist looking outline there. And then Bob says to Alice, look, you know, I really need to know how much electricity you are consuming every millisecond, if I could, well, every minute or every 15 minutes, really, if I can get away with it, so that I can offer you interesting services, maybe marketing to you, maybe bill you correctly, maybe, you know, find out if my infrastructure supports the kind of loads you put on it. So a variety of reasons that may or may not be interesting to Alice. Okay, and Alice is kind of faced with a little bit of a hard choice here because she's like, well, I am not really sure. Like, I wouldn't mind you doing some of the things you are saying you would like to do with my energy readings, <coughs> but I'm not really sure if I'm giving you the energy readings, maybe you will also do all the other things. Okay, you will, you know, start shifting marketing material towards me or you will profile me and try to sell me the worst tariff for whatever I consume rather than the best one etc. Right? So Alice is a little bit apprehensive because she's not really in love with her energy company at all. Okay? And believe me, in the UK we're not in love with our energy companies. 
So, and this is really at the essence and at the heart of the contemporary privacy problem. The privacy problem we have is not that we want to talk to people we trust and love and we need secure channels to do that. It's because we have to interact every day with a whole host of services, be it your energy company or Facebook or Google or whatever, that actually do useful things for us to some degree. But in order to actually interact with them, we have to provide them with information so that they can compute on that information and do stuff back with us. When we give them that information, that information gets out of our control and we don't quite know what else they do with that information. And that creates the privacy problem we have today. Now, this cannot just be solved with secure channels. It is not just that Alice is afraid that the data on the way to Bob will go lost. She's actually ultimately scared of what's going to happen to the data if it is in the hands of Bob, who's the recipient. Okay, so let me give you a little bit of a, an insight into how the energy market in the UK works. I, I appreciate that, uh, at least in, in Germany and Holland, that I'm aware of how it works. It's slightly different, and it's a little bit surprising, maybe, unless Belgium happens to also work in a similar way. So as you can imagine, in that game, some more energy has to be produced. Okay? There is some kind of factory or solar panels, not, not actually in the UK, solar panels are not really a big thing in the UK, believe it or not. Wind farms, you know, they, they kind of work well. And then there is eventually your home here, okay? That needs electricity in some form or another. And Usually to get electricity to your home, you effectively contract with Bob's energy company. There is a market, there are many of those companies, and you pick one, usually according to the colors of their brochure or, you know, whatever. And you say, okay, you know, let's have a contract, you will provide me with electricity. And then what happens? Let's look at the flow of electricity between those three parties. So what happens is that the energy producer uh, puts the electricity, these are, this is flow of electrons now, into the grid, okay, this is a national infrastructure, big cables around, moving things around, and then the grid routes that electricity in a, you know, not very clever way, just pushes electricity, whatever, into a local distributor, okay, and that local distributor in fact connects to your meter, that meters how much electricity is coming into your home and then from there your appliances are connected. Now notice that there is no flow of electrons going through Bob, your energy supplier. Okay, there are no cables. This is a dirty business. Our suppliers are not in the business of actually doing engineering. God forbid. What they are in the business of is getting the money from you, okay, and actually paying for contracts for production of electricity that covers the consumption of their customer base. Okay, so on, they are on the money path, not the electricity path, which is the lucrative path to be on. Okay, so <laughs> lesson number one, if you want to do well in life, be on the money path, not the work path. Good. So, the problem, of course, of not being on the electricity path, and that's really the only problem, is the fact that they don't really get much visibility as to what's going on. Okay? And this is why uh, there is this whole initiative, to some extent, to modernize the metering infrastructure to better support that kind of model. Okay? So, currently, because they don't actually see what's going on on that path, there is a bit of an estimate about how much Alice's home electricity is using. They take one meter, in theory they should be taking one meter reading every month. In practice they take one, they should by law take one every three months, that's the minimum. In practice they usually try to get at least one a year. Okay, and on the basis of this, and on the basis of some back of the envelope models of how much a household is consuming in the summer, at Christmas, during football season, whatever, okay, they basically estimate how much households across the country are consuming and how many percent of customers in different areas are with each supplier and roughly make an estimate of how much money should be paid to each producer, okay? Out of the fraction of the total energy consumption, okay? This is not cool, okay? Like we're talking about big bucks here. So the idea is that we need much better metering to support that, 
Okay? And in particular, we would like to basically get metering data at quite a fine grain granularity sometimes, every 15 minutes, every hour, at least <coughs> once a day. Okay? At least once a month, I would say. This is like already the statutory requirement in theory. And then give it to Bob so that Bob can actually do accounting and even bill households at a much finer grain because electricity at 6 o'clock in the afternoon costs more than in the middle of the night. Okay? But of course, once we start measuring how much electricity is consumed in different households, we might as well use that for other purposes as well, like finding out how thick should be the electricity lines going to particular neighborhoods. Okay? Rich neighborhoods will buy electric cars faster than poorer neighborhoods, therefore we'll have to have thicker lines, but we need to identify those on the basis of evidence. So it is a good idea once you actually do have readings that are going to this mysterious entity in the UK called the DCC, uh, to also use them for other purposes throughout the operation of the energy <coughs> market. Okay, both for market purposes and for engineering purposes. And this is the situation we're in today. Okay? The engineering situation and the economic situation. The two are very much related. However, there is a problem. When in the Netherlands they tried to effectively gather the same kind of data, people were very upset because um, that data turns out to be actually quite revealing about what is going on in your home. Okay? And here I have a graph from a very classic paper that was one of the first ones to popularize the fact that actually if I record very carefully how much energy your home is using, I can see patterns. I can see your dryer coming on in the morning. Well, that is if you had a shower. Maybe you don't have showers in the morning. Ah, that's a bit not nice, huh? The fridge, you know, your lights going on, watching TV at night, you know the heater going on, cooking, not cooking, you know, waking up at night very often to use the toilet, maybe you check your prostate, you know. These things are quite revealing, okay, particularly uh, if tomorrow we also decide that it's not just electricity that needs that kind of data, but it's also water, it's also gas, right? Suddenly cooking, you know, microwaving food versus cooking a nice meal, you know, your, your insurance company would be extremely interested to have that data. Your government would be very interested in having that data to plan healthcare, you know, it's all for the common good, etc. Right? So in fact, the worst thing though that can happen is that this data goes directly to your supplier with whom you have a commercial relationship. You're not mates with your supplier, they are actually your commercial partner. So you want to be in good terms with them, but fundamentally your interests are diametrically opposed. You want to pay as little as possible and they want you to pay as much as possible. Okay, like it's, you know, th this is fine. This is not some kind of taboo. We're in a market economy here, right? That's what your relationship with your supplier is. So suddenly your supplier with whom you are in this friendly but antagonistic relationship will have all this data to be able to profile you and sell you the tariff that will benefit them most, not you. Okay? And this is a bit scary if you think about it. So in fact there is a lot of research and I was told that this is not an audience of cryptographers so I'd rather actually give you some funny stories about what you can do with electricity and what is actually the history of people's sensitivity around electricity because it's such a weird subject, right? Why would you be sensitive about your electricity consumption? Now, first of all, everybody, of course, has seen the Hollywood movie or the Hollywood series where, you know, uh, the cannabis growing farm in, in the loft gets busted because the police finds out that you're consuming 10 times more electricity than you should because of the lamps. Okay, and I guess our proximity to Holland here has made everybody uh, familiar with that setting. But in fact, in fact, beyond that stereotype, which I'm not going to discuss any further, there are some really cool stories about the history of privacy when it comes to electricity. It turns out the first time there was a mention of electricity and privacy being kind of associated with each other was in the 1970s. In the 1970s in Germany, there was a terrorist organization called the Red Army Faction and they had safe houses. 
Okay, so when they were about to, to commit a terrorist attack, they would actually have a house that, you know, was just there for them to be able to plan their operation, hide, do the attack, come back, clean after themselves, leave. And therefore, if the police wants to catch them, the key to catching them was to identify where the safe houses were. Because as soon as basically they knew where the safe houses were, they could put a police car outside, see when it became active, and catch them with, you know, explosives, guns, and all that stuff, and take them out. Okay? How do you find a safe house, though? Okay? How do you find a safe house? This is not, you know, the 2000. We don't quite have a dragnet surveillance system, so how do you do it? So they noticed a few patterns. Okay? The first pattern was that the terrorists were actually renting these houses using cash. This was not super uncommon. Okay? This is the 70s. There isn't like a massive credit card boom in Germany quite yet. Okay? But this is not what everybody was doing. There was a banking system and you know. So that was the first thing. The second thing, and that was really the key, was that these houses were empty for a very long time despite the fact that the rent was always being paid cash every month, okay, so they were actually well looked after economically but empty, except for very short periods of time where they were intensely used day and night, okay, and then they were empty again. So how do you detect if a house is empty or not that is being paid by cash? You look at its electricity supply. If the house is empty, very little electricity is ever going to be used, actually none, unless you actually have a fridge, okay, and therefore, you're able to detect all the houses that are being rented for cash and are empty for a long time. Okay? And they just made a list of all these by just taking the energy consumption of all the households, I think, in massive cities, and basically putting police cars just outside every house. And the interesting thing is that they were successful in catching terrorists, which is pretty cool. Okay? But what is even cooler is that Everybody kind of freaked out about this, and the, that technique went to their constitutional court. And the constitutional court said, despite the fact that they did catch terrorists, it was unconstitutional to do that, because it is a disproportionate violation of privacy to do this kind of indiscriminate gathering of energy information. That is the 1970s. Okay? The energy information that was being gathered was at the granularity of a month. Okay? However, since, we have discovered that many more interesting things can be inferred if one observes at the energy consumption of a house. In particular, there is a whole line of work in uh, electrical engineering that looks at how can we recognize which devices you have in your home on the basis of your aggregate energy consumption. Okay? And this is useful because this way, you can be sent advice that you know, your fridge of that type is getting old or malfunctioning, or you can detect if you know, you're one of the households that is using air conditioning based on electricity, and you may be asked to back off if there is a high demand, etc. Okay? So your energy consumption, <coughs> according to Hart, who's uh, an expert in uh, what is called uh, non-intrusive load monitoring, uh, basically gives an x-ray of all the devices you have in your home and also when they're on. Okay, fine. I mean, fridges are fridges, ovens are ovens. What can you do? This is not so bad. Then people looked a little bit more into this thing and they said, well, let's look at the devices that somehow modulate electricity in more interesting ways than the fridge. Okay, let's look at the TV. Okay, and they started recording the energy consumption coming out of the TV. And they found out that when the TV is more dark, there is less energy being consumed, and when it's more light, there is more energy being consumed, which kind of makes sense. Light is energy after all. But then what they said is the following. They said, well, look, if we know that you're watching a movie, and I mean, how many movies are there? There are 1,600 good movies. Maybe you're watching a bad movie. But anyway, they made a library, effectively, of signatures of a few thousand movies. Okay? And you know, Star Wars starts very dark and, you know, yellow text on black background and then, you know, it becomes very light after 15 minutes when they are like in a desert type thing. And, you know, each movie has a very different pattern effectively of being light and dark. Okay? And if you observe the energy supply over the three hours you're watching Star Wars, you're actually able to detect you're watching Star Wars and not something else. Okay? So suddenly, 
there is a little bit of a worry here because in particular the next study said, okay, well, great, so there are 1,600 <coughs> movies, but in many European countries there are only, you know, a few channels of TV. So we can find out which channel you're looking at, which news are you looking at, are you looking at the news or not, okay? By just profiling effectively the streams of channels as they, they modulate the brightness of LCD monitors in this particular case. And then once people started looking at TVs, the obvious next stage is to say what else has a monitor that is quite sensitive? Well, your computer has a monitor, okay? And then they did exactly the same uh, exercise while people were loading web pages and browsing different websites. This is a much smaller study, so it's just an indication that something is going on. It's not like rocket, uh, re really, really solid in my opinion. I mean, the authors think it is solid. I'm, I'm a little bit more ambivalent. And they said, well, they're able to distinguish which out of six major websites you're in fact browsing just because, you know, they have a slightly different types of brightness and the, the actual transitions do slightly different things. Okay? So then there were kind of slightly more sociological studies where authors asked, participants uh, to keep records and diaries of their activities in the home, <coughs> okay? And of course then they observed also the energy supply and they say trivial things like they can detect when people are asleep, when people are actually present in the house, how many people are present, etc. Okay, so this is just to give you a feel that within the scientific literature it kind of is quite well established that observing electricity consumption does give out quite a bit of information about what's going on in the home, depending, of course, on the granularity at which you record. But at any granularity, you do get information that is sensitive, such as is someone at home or not, are they asleep or not. Okay, now, is there really any alternative, though, to just giving your information away to do all these great things in the smart grid? And in fact, you know, even a consumer organization in the UK says, well, really, there isn't. You know, there isn't. In fact, they have a special FAQ on the website. This is consumer focus. Logo has been grayed out. Um, public body, it's fine. Um, and they say, well, you know, your energy supply will need some information on how much energy you use and when you use it in the case of time of use customers. So they kind of give up. They say, look, if we're going to benefit as a society from all these good things, you just have to give the information. I mean, what alternative is there, right? And this is actually quite a, a sober point of view for consumer focus. However, this is the subject of the rest of the talk. And what I will try to convince you here is that, in fact, we can get a lot of benefits <coughs> of time of use tariffs, statistics, being able to optimize our infrastructure on the basis of real-time data without actually having to give out all this information to our suppliers. Okay? So we do not actually need to give out that information to get a lot of the benefits. I can't say all of the benefits, but I would say a large fraction of the benefits. Okay, so first of all, I would like to, to say, how do we actually, for example, go about achieving one of the hardest goals of the smart metering deployment, which is to compute time of use tariffs. Because you see, time of use tariffs take how much energy you're consuming every 15 minutes and they multiply that with a tariff that is applicable just to that half hour. So in theory, they need very granular access to how much energy you're consuming. Okay? It's actually one of the most intrusive use of electricity information. <coughs> And really, I think that when it comes to saying it is inevitable to share our data, there has been a failure of imagination. Because here is a, a strawman, the simplest system you can imagine, for not requiring your supplier to have those tariffs. It has problems. But this is a strawman example of what we could do. We could basically say, okay, Alice is recording how much energy is consumed every 15 minutes. Bob needs to compute a bill on that. Instead of sending the data to Bob, what we could do strawman proposal is to just send the tariffs to the meters. This is anyway the case in the UK because you have to be able to see at any time how much your energy is cost. So that is not an extra step here. This is happening already. And then what the meter does is it multiplies how much energy is consumed every 15 minutes. It already has to know that. It already has to record that. It already has to actually do that multiplication with the tariff and then keep an accumulator of how much you owe it. 
and then at the end of the month, just send a monthly bill. Okay? As simple as that. So it is a little bit of a failure of imagination to say there is no other way of doing things because here is a very credible other way. Okay. However, however, it has problems. It has problems. Uh, the advantage of it is that the meter readings that are sensitive never leave your home. So that's cool. Okay? It has some good properties in terms of integrity and assurance because everybody trusts the meter to do its job correctly. If the meter is not doing the job correctly, we have bigger problems than time of use tariffs not being able to be computed. Therefore, since we trust the meter to do its job, why not also compute the bill? <coughs> Fine. That's okay. However, the limitations are that suddenly we have really specialized this infrastructure to just do one thing, compute bills. But really, the reason we're trying to deploy smart meters everywhere is not just to compute bills, it is also to do other things, to, to compute statistics, to give you a feel of how you compare in your consumption with your neighbors, to create some friendly competitions to consume more electri no, less electricity. You know, th there are other reasons to actually gather statistics than to just do one computation, okay? So that's actually quite limiting. We have to, to admit that it wouldn't actually scale to keep sending computations to the meter and ask the meters to do it because the meter is actually a pretty simple device. We also are limited in that the meter can only do computations on your data. But to do statistics, we want to do computations on the data of the whole neighborhood or of all the customers of a supplier. Okay, so that does not really fit in this, right? I mean, someone can say, okay, great, you can solve that problem, but what about statistics? We can't really do them in that way. Uh, we don't want to generalize this approach to actually having mobile code. I mean, I mean this is a you know, web security f uh, forum here. So, you know, one could think of actually having a JavaScript interpreter in the meter and having mobile code going around and, you know, we know where that leads to. It's not a place we want to be uh, for this particular deployment, okay? So, it's very limiting. Can we do better? Can we do better is the question. And the answer is yes, we can do better. And here is one paradigm that myself and colleagues have proposed in that context, but is also more generally applicable. Imagine we have some sensor. In the case of electricity, this is a meter that measures how much electricity you're using every 15 minutes. What this sensor can do is it can basically publish readings, provide readings that are signed in special ways and you know, certified and that you cannot modify as you wish. So they're cryptographically protected readings to a user device. For example, a mobile phone or some cloud that the user trusts or whatever. And then a relying service, in this particular case, it will indeed be your supplier, for example, or anyone who wishes to do a computation generally on these readings, sends you effectively a query. Okay? They say, could you please compute this thing, for example, this bill, on your readings. Okay? And then your user device says, oh yeah, sure, I'll do that for you, and just sends back the result. And the world would be a wonderful place, right? If everybody trusted each other to do this, okay? So, but the problem here is that as I have described it, you can see the problem, right? Can you see the problem? <coughs> the readings, oh, what's the problem with the readings? Okay, so can they trust that the readings are correct? Yes. Can they trust that? Good question. Any other problems? That's, there are many problems. That's one problem. What if they steal your phone? Who steals my phone? My supplier? I mean, they're evil, but not quite so much. I mean, <laughs> okay, so if they steal your phone, what happens to those readings, right? Suddenly you, you expose yourself. That's a very good point. Any other problem? Turning it off is not so much of a problem because they will just bill you as much as they can. <laughs> if you don't answer, you just pay the maximum and that's a good incentive to answer. Um, what is your user device? Yes. In fact, it goes even further than that. What if you compromise your user device? Well, so that... In any way. Right. So that... Because, of course, if you are entrusted to compute the bill you owe to someone else, the best thing you could compute is the function that always returns zero, okay? Because you always would like to say, 
it's fine. I, I happen to not owe you anything. I didn't really have a shower this week and I didn't really cook. Okay, so if basically the only thing you do is you take readings, you do the computation and you return results, that's not a solution. However, thanks to the powers of modern cryptography, we can avoid that happening. What we need to do is here for the readings, first of all to be encrypted so that when they're in transit between the sensor and the user device, not to be readable to anyone except for the actual user device that should read them. Secondly, we need to actually cryptographically protect them in such a way that only the meter can in fact generate them. Everybody else can verify that they are correct, but cannot actually forge them. So that's the second thing we need to do. That is on the side of the readings that you were worried about very correctly. However, on that side, something else has to happen as well, because maybe the readings are correct, but we just don't apply the correct function to them. Okay, we just always return zero, as I said. So to some extent, first of all, the user device needs to know that this computation comes from the right party that has the right to, do, to ask us to do computations on meter readings. But the most magic thing has to happen next, which is that not only we need to return the result of the computation, namely how much we owe the company if we're computing a bill, but we also somehow have to convince that relying party that the result is correct. And we need to do this without revealing to them what the actual readings were, okay? And there is a particular type of construct in cryptography called the zero-knowledge proof, okay? And the zero-knowledge proof allows you to prove to someone a statement. For example, this is indeed the correct result of that computation applied to those readings that were, by the way, signed. That's a statement, okay? And it allows you to prove that this statement is correct without, in fact, revealing the secrets involved in that statement. Namely, in this particular case, the readings. Okay? So, in practice, when we apply this to the energy market, we have to do something that is closer to the architecture they already have. And it looks like this. Alice's meter records readings, but at the beginning of time, we pair the meter with a device, a browser, whatever computer, cloud service, and they exchange a key. And then Alice's meter sends encrypted readings to a big repository that just has now encrypted readings. These are not readable to the repository anymore. And then the device, like the phone, just requests them and decrypts them on the device. And then we allow the energy company to send, for example, a query that requests the phone to compute the bill, and the phone computes both the answer and a zero-knowledge <coughs> proof that indeed the result is correct, however, does not leak what the readings were. Okay? Magic of modern cryptography. I'm not going to go into huge details of how this is done. Now, the interesting thing here is that once the data is available on a user device or on a user cloud or on a user PC, on whatever, on a trusted party maybe that you, you want to manage that process on your behalf. If, you know, I always get the, the question of, you know, my grandfather does not have a mobile phone. My grandfather can actually trust a, another service to play that role as well. We have lots of deployment options. But once these readings are on some other device, then it can basically answer all sorts of queries for, from other parties in the energy industry. Right? I mean, you can start comparing, you know, what you're doing with a baseline, finding out if you would be better off with another supplier, et cetera, et cetera. All of that without leaking your, your readings. And furthermore, you can provide responses that are indeed certified to be correct, given your meter reading. So if you go to some shop that sells insulation and the shop says, look, I'm going to sell you the insulation, but if you're you know, energy consumption does not go down by 10%, I give you back 100 euros. They don't want to say this unless they're sure that in a year's time, the meter readings on which, you know, they're making that claim, they're making that, um, that offer, are actually genuine. Because there is money involved, right? Well, you can convince them that indeed, when you come back and you say, sorry, my energy consumption did not go down, you can prove to them that that statement was done on the actual meter readings from your house. It's not just something you just made up by writing a few numbers down. Okay. Now, uh, we note that 
it is easier to do all this than many uh, similar cryptographic solutions because no one is anonymous in this. Everybody knows everybody else. They have business relationship with everybody else and stuff. So this is not some crazy cypherpunk fantasy. This is like everybody knows each other. Okay. And um, all of the readings, when I say encrypted and encoded, they're done in a special way to allow really efficient zero knowledge proof. So that's actually quite fast in doing it. Okay, so there are some technical details about how the meter has to encode the readings. The key thing to take out of this is not any of the equations here that may scare you. It is that it is very simple code. It is in fact a piece of code that we have uh, encoded in C and verified it, which is pretty cool. And we even found a, a security bug. Um, we were actually uh, doing the encryption uh, 32 bits for 32 bits, but we were basically messing up how we are converting some numbers, which meant that only one byte out of four was being encrypted. Very embarrassing, but verification caught that and we fixed it. And now we have a theorem on a piece of C that our meters are actually signing everything correctly, which is a success story for verification. And I should share that with you because there aren't that many. So, of course, you may ask uh, yourself, what kind of computations can we efficiently prove correct? Okay, because you can imagine that you know, the machinery necessary for us to receive queries, execute them, and then produce a proof that they are correct might be a bit heavier than just doing the computation. And the answer is, in theory, we could do any computation. In practice, linear computation, so taking the meter readings, multiplying them with some constants, adding them, that's super fast. We can do that so fast that we, compute, we could compute the bills of the whole United Kingdom for a month in three weeks of computation on one CPU core. Okay? So this is more than real time for the whole nation on one CPU core, <coughs> very fast. However, as soon as we start doing nonlinear things like, oh, if the, the consumption this month is over a threshold, apply that tariff, it is under that threshold, apply another tariff, then it becomes a little bit slower, okay? And we can basically do about 100 operations per second, which is still okay for billing. It's not okay if we're trying to stream video, decompress, and prove that the decompressed frames are correct. That we can't do, okay? And we can also do very efficient lookups, which means that really we can encode any function uh, efficiently. So if your billing strategy is crazy and non-linear, right, if you consume 10 units, you pay 100 euros. If you consume 21, you pay nothing. We can do that, even though we don't really see why you, you would ever have that scheme. So, in general, we use zero knowledge proofs, and I don't want to actually uh, go into the details because that's not really that relevant for the message here. Now, however, when we first spoke to cryptographers about this, they said, hmm, that's not good enough. Because you see, the bill itself may leak information, okay? And in particular, the bill the, the tariff could be crafted in a very specific way to leak how much energy you have consumed a particular half hour or 15 minutes. How would the energy company extract that information? What it would do is it would basically cost your energy at all other times at zero. And then the unit, each unit that you consume at this particular 15 minutes would cost one euro per unit. Okay? And then what would happen is that all your consumption for the rest of the month would just not contribute to the bill at all. And then the amount of euros you would pay at the end of the month would be exactly equal to how much you consume during 15 minutes. So that's a leakage of information. So what did we do to avoid this? And I have to say that, you know, we weren't quite sure this is a real problem because, of course, you know, the energy company wants to get money. Why would we do that? But it's a possibility. So we said, okay, what if we actually add noise to the bills in order to hide how much the real consumption was? Now, adding noise to the bills is uh, mathematically a very elegant thing to do. But, of course, you know, um, no one wants to pay more for electricity then, and this is again Alice being not uh, visible. No one wants to pay more for electricity just to hide how much they have consumed for 15 minutes. Yeah? So it turns out that not only we can indeed hide how much you consume by adding noise, but we can also keep an accounting tally of how much you overpaid over the year and reclaim that at the end of the year or offset it over the bill for the year after. 
Okay? So these kind of proofs that we do, the zero knowledge proof allows us to effectively do oblivious banking. You, you have this secret tally of money with your energy supplier that goes up and up and up as you overpay. Okay? And at the end you can prove that it is over some amount and reclaim it back without revealing how much is left or how much you actually added every month. Okay? Not a very practical solution, not to a very practical problem. In practice, most real people we talk to that are not cryptographers are not particularly worried about that attack. So we never actually fielded any of this and I don't think it, it has much of a future. But in theory you could do it, okay? which is pretty cute. Now, so when I went to the energy industry and I said, I have a solution to your problems, don't worry, you don't have to go through privacy disasters because you can implement this. They said to me, this sounds really nice, but I know how to write my billing policies in SQL. I don't know how to write zero knowledge proof protocols. Okay, you are pointing me to some papers, they contain Greek symbols. And I have no idea what they mean. If I write a Greek symbol to my, you know, Python interpreter, it actually accepts Unicode symbols, but it won't do anything that we assume it will do. Okay? And it's true. It's true, right? So it took us, and you know, we are trained in cryptography and computer security. It took us actually quite a few years to work out what the best protocols are to prove like multiplications or linear things, etc. So how can you actually ask developers? to now start not just writing the code that does the billing correctly, but also to write a proof that the code did the right thing and that the result is correct without revealing the inputs. Okay, I mean, most people don't believe it's possible, let alone they don't know how to do it, and that's cool, because they're not cryptographers. So what did we do? We built a special language called ZQL. Okay, it, sounds for, it stands for Zero Knowledge Query Language that is basically encoding some semantics from relational algebra. So in theory, we could make it look a little bit like SQL as well. Okay? And that allows you to express computations such as this one that says, I have a function smart meter bill that takes basically a table of public integers and private integer, which is really the time and the reading at that time. And then it also allows me to take uh, another lookup table of an integer to an integer, which is a reading mapping to a fee. And then what I do is the sum of the integer reading, and I look up for each reading um, in the fee table, and then I sum them all up. And this is actually quite a deep encoding of a kind of relational, functional looking thing. But effectively what it does is, you know, select, um, sum, okay, of reading times fee, okay, where time in one table is equal, sorry, the, the reading in one table is equal to the reading in the other table, okay, and then it sums them all together and gives you a nonlinear sum, okay. So what you do is you can write that or the syntactically sugared version of that, and not only it will produce the code that does that, but it will automatically also produce all the zero knowledge protocols, both to prove the statement without revealing the actual secret values, which are anything that is not public there, and to verify when you get a result and a proof that indeed the result is correct. Okay? And it does that all automatically. You don't need to know any crypto to do it, which is cool. That's exactly the kind of tools we need to, to have in order to allow this to be deployed. Uh, and this is like the picture, so you get your ZQL query, and you compile it, and you can basically run the code in the data sources. These are the meters, effectively, that just generate the readings, and then there is code that you run to prove a particular computation here and to actually compute the result, and then there is the code that you run to verify whatever uh, result you got that it is actually genuine, and then accept it and send the bill. Okay, however, all of this still does not solve a very, very important class of problems, namely how can we do computations, not just for one household, but for many of them. Statistics by their very nature are not just about one individual, but about, let's say, finding out how much all of your homes together consume. So even being able to do simple sums is quite important. And we could not do simple sums here because we don't just have one user that is allowed to know all of your readings and then prove that the sum is a certain amount. Okay? So we need to do something slightly different. 
So that basically required us to look at protocols, cryptographic protocols, to do privacy-friendly aggregates, okay? <coughs> and these are super useful throughout the grid, okay? Statistics is one of the main reasons we're actually doing smart grids, but in particular, they're important to do theft detection. How does theft detection work? What you do is you put a meter in, let's say, every house in a neighborhood, and you also put a meter at the substation that feeds the whole neighborhood, and they'll measure things over the month, okay? And then at the end of the month, you ask yourself the following question. Is the actual sum of these households, as they reported their readings, roughly, because the line also has some losses, but it should be in the same kind of ballpark as the big <coughs> meter here. Everything that was consumed here should be accounted for here and paid for. That's the important thing, paid for, yeah? If at the end of the month, you discover that the sum here is much lower than this, it means that someone, some enterprising soul, has maybe taken some electricity from the wire instead of stealing it from their neighbor. Now, you see, the energy companies don't care about you stealing from your neighbor because that's paid for. <coughs> I'm joking, of course, because it is actually a very sad thing that people do steal from the granny next door because that's actually more of a problem. But if you steal it from the wire, that technique actually will detect it. Okay? However, to do it in a privacy and friendly way, you need to know all these readings. But you see, the actual calculation itself is not privacy invasive in the sense that you compare an aggregate consumption with another aggregate consumption, and you just try to find out which one is bigger. If only we could compute this sum without actually being able to get the exact readings here, right? we could do this com computation, which is a high-value computation to catch fraudsters, without the need to know exactly how much electricity is being consumed at every 15-minute interval if you do it at that granularity uh, on the other side. Okay. It's so a very important problem. And of course, just knowing the sums allows you to do statistics, to do your network planning, to do the settlement process of how much money the supplier should pay, the grid, uh, or whether the total consumption matches the contracts it has for its, how its uh, customers, etc. But just that is our motivating example. So how can we do this without actually, how can we get the sum of, let's say, three households without having to leak how much they each consume? Okay, and I'll show you how to do that for any time period, for a month or for 15 minutes. <coughs> so we start with our three households. Okay, and they each have, of course, a reading, X1, X2, X3, that we try to keep secret. And our protocols work in two phases. The first phase is a one-off, what I call a group formation phase, where we say, you three, you're a group, and we will only be able to extract the sum of your consumptions, not exactly how much you consume each. The second one is actually when we start producing these readings and then we just get the sums, okay, from now on. We never are able to then see how much each of them do. So the group formation works simply by each of the meters coming up with a public key, signing it, and sending it to a group manager. And the group manager just sending the public keys of each meter to each other meter. These public keys are Diffie-Hellman keys. If you are like that, you know what it means, otherwise it doesn't really matter. What really matters is that once basically a meter knows their secret part of their public key and the public key of another meter, they can derive a shared key that no one else knows. So this is the shared key of meter one with meter two, this is the shared key of meter one with meter three, this is the shared key of meter one with meter two, which happens to be the same one as the other one, it's shared. And this is the, the shared key between two and three, etc. So you have basically a shared key with all the meters in your group, okay? This is done once. You do it, you know, once a year, once per installation of meter, whatever. And now you start producing the readings, okay? Let's say every 15 minutes. What do you do then? What you do then is you basically take that key and use it to basically hash the time you're in currently, okay? And you do that basically for each meter that you, you have in your group. For the meters that have a name that is bigger than yours, you just add it. For the meters that have a name that is smaller than yours, you subtract it. So you effectively have a sum 
of random looking elements that are derivations of the time and the key you share with everybody else. Okay? And we name that SI for meter I. This is like the secret for meter I at time t. Okay? And then what we do is we encrypt effectively the readings with this SI. And the encryption system we use is called addition. <coughs> okay? Addition modulo 2 to the 32, which turns out that if actually this SI is indeed random, is perfect. This is actually like as good as the one-time pad. Of course, this is not totally random because it is the process of this thing. Okay? But don't put down addition as a crypto system. It's actually a very good crypto system indeed. So what we do is we take the meter reading I. Actually, I should have named it X here. I apologize. But, and then we add it to this weird formula here. Okay? And that produces a ciphertext CI. Okay? And now each of the meters just publishes the ciphertexts. Okay? Now, so far this is a bit mysterious, particularly this one. Okay, what is going on here? Now notice though what happens when then we take all these ciphertexts and we add them together. Okay? What has happened is that each meter has once added one of these factors and one subtracted it. The meter that had a name that is bigger has added it, the other one has subtracted it. So what that means is that once we actually add them all together, all these factors cancel out and whatever basically remains is simply the sum of these meter readings Ri or Xi. Okay? However, just by looking at these Ci's here, or any other information, you cannot in fact infer anything more. Namely, you cannot find out exactly how much the actual consumptions Ri of the meters were. Okay, so you can get their sum, but you cannot get the individual meter readings by themselves. I'm not lying to you, this is the protocol. We have verified the protocol's correctness as well using a, a variety of tools. However, so this protocol is very interesting because currently it has been implemented in meters. This is why we wrote the C code that actually produces these, uh, uh, these things in the meter. And is being tested in a pilot in the Netherlands by Aleander, which is a, a network operator, I believe, or distributor there. Okay, so they have a, a village that basically will be running these things. Hopefully right now there is a wall of 100 meters doing this for a few months to make sure that all the, you know, the village is not going to lose electricity because of us, at least. Okay? However, the protocol, and again, it's, it's done by, uh, again, a quasi-private company, whatever, whose logo and name has been grayed out. So, uh, oh, but, oops, the name has not been totally grayed out. However, <laughs> Uh, despite their good work, uh, the protocol has some limitations. And the limitation is that, as you can imagine, the size of the group is limited because everybody has to then share keys with everybody else. And that limits, by its very nature, the size of the group. Uh, the more members, the more storage is needed in the meter because you need to have all these keys and do all these operations, so that's not cool. Now, the worst thing, though, is if a meter fails, you get nothing, okay? Because the, the factors cannot cancel out anymore. Okay, so you're left basically with a bunch of ciphertext, one is missing, you get no information. And that's not cool, because it turns out meters fail all the time. Okay? <laughs> that's also something that I didn't realize, that actually these smart meters, they do fail. And the communication fails as well. Exactly. So it's a problem. We, we want to get reliable statistics despite meters going down. In fact, this is why we want reliable statistics, to sometimes detect errors, okay? The groups are fixed. So what happens if the, the distributors of electricity wants to measure a neighborhood, but the supplier wants to measure just their customers? These are distinct groups. They sometimes overlap not. But what do we do? Do we put meters in many groups? That's even more overhead. And then, of course, the final limitation is that, okay, that allows us to compute sums, but what about other things? For example, we would like to compute standard deviations, variances, minimum, maximum, whatever, right? I mean, the, the world is not just made of sums. 
So just to give you a, a, another a little feel, we have augmented that protocol to effectively make it robust and solve a lot of these problems, except for the last one. I will not present this protocol. However, the slides will be available for you to uh, revel into looking at it. It is not much more complex than what I have showed you, except that it relies on some authorities playing the role of the other meters that do not fail. Okay? And as long as you trust that some of these authorities are going to be honest and you can have as many as you, you feel paranoid about, that is okay. The economics of that though are tricky because who are these authorities, right? And how do you make sure that you sustain them without turning them into the equivalent of the smart metering privacy um, certification authorities, which no one wants to replicate. Um, then even that has problems, which I will not go into, but the final problem that we need to solve is nonlinear computations, okay? And nonlinear computations, again, are very important to detect fraud. Okay, so it turns out that every time I talk about privacy, in fact, the thing that most captivates industry's imagination is how do they prevent fraud in a way that, you know, people are happy to give them the data to process it and find the fraudsters, okay? So line theft detection, again, can be done if you check the voltage on, on one, in one house and another house and there is an abnormal drop. Okay? So the question then becomes, if I compare the voltages across two meters that should be next to each other, is that drop normal, given how much a household consumes, or does it correspond to a household and a cannabis farm, and then another household? Okay? Basically. That's really what they're trying, and that's not really subtle. Okay? Like, people don't just steal electricity to put a kettle on, they steal electricity <coughs> to run big things. Okay? Sadly, this greater than T, which is the threshold, is a nonlinear computation. So even our previous protocol does not actually take care of that. Okay? And in in instead, uh, what we need to do is use secret sharing based computations okay? in order to then compute jointly and secretly between these, either these two households or the authorities that act on their behalf, this thing. Please read the papers to find out more about it. So, I don't want to keep you much longer because you have indulged me uh, and uh, my quick crypto for, for a while now, but I hope you did get a feel for what we can do. However, however, there are still big problems, right? And the problems are not really to do anymore with the cryptography at this point. They are how do we integrate the cryptography into real world security and general systems, okay? So for example, what if the devices, the user devices, are insecure, right? If we rely on user devices for users' privacy, then the privacy goes away, and it may even be worse than trusting our supplier, because maybe our supplier will abuse the data a little bit, but maybe all the hackers are not going to get to it. Well, maybe the hackers will get to it anyway. Who knows, right? Um, what if the user does not have any devices or any services that they trust? Can that user still be protected in terms of their data, or do they have no option but to provide it to the supplier? Maybe that's okay. Maybe that's okay. Maybe those users inevitably will have to trust someone. Why not the supplier? Maybe we can do something else. How can we keep meters simple? Okay. Um, how do we know that the meter that actually is producing these readings indeed produces the correct readings and doesn't just also send clear readings to everybody around, along with playing the protocol, pretending to provide privacy. It just also leaks readings, okay? Um, and then, of course, there are the economics of security problems. What are the incentives to run these protocols from the point of view of the supplier? I mean, the supplier has clear incentives to get a lot of data. Why would they do the privacy-friendly way? Uh, and if we rely on third parties that process data or help users process data, or an ecosystem of apps, who writes those and why? Right? What, what do they get out of it? Okay. Now, one thing though is for sure true, which is that just giving the data to the supplier is really the worst privacy option. Okay? And it's kind of funny because it is being presented as the inevitable way and the only way of actually doing all this. Whereas what I'm saying here is that we have a lot of options. And you know, it's not clear which one is best and all that stuff, but it's kind of funny that the industry immediately says, well, the supplier's industry actually says, don't worry about all this, you're pretty little heads, just give us the data and we'll deal with these problems ourselves, yeah? 
because they don't have any answers to how to protect your privacy any better as well. They'll just put it in the database and hope that everything goes okay. So let's move on from here. And the question then becomes, what is really stopping the deployment of these protocols? Okay, and, and here it is really um, a cry for cryptographers to start upping their game a little bit, okay, and to start, you know, really helping solve the problem. Cryptographers have had a great 30 years of, you know, writing theoretical papers, coming up with what is a zero-knowledge proof, and it's beautiful stuff, but fundamentally they ne never really, I mean, they talk the talk, they never really walk the walk. So when you go to a cryptographer and you say, can you prove that a bill is correct? They're like, of course, you can prove anything you want, okay? But if you tell them, well, how many hours will it take for you, an expert, to actually produce quality code that will do that, and how much time would it take to maintain it and to change it according to the billing policy, they will just say, oh, look, a monkey. Okay, they, they will not even engage with that question. They have no idea, right? So few people have been actually engineering those systems, okay? So it's actually a, a call not to you, but to the cryptographic community to start getting out of their corner where they just play with crazy mathematics and realize that now is the time when we need those mathematics to go into our protocols. And then the question becomes, what are the costs? What are the tools we can provide to the communities of developers to be able to make these things accessible? What are the APIs that our libraries should have so that people such as yourselves can just say, don't worry, you can go really to your manager tomorrow. What do we need to do for you to go to your manager tomorrow and say, don't worry, I know that you think the only way to do this particular functionality is to just gather all the data and put it in a database. However, if we use that component, it's a very high quality component that allows us to do exactly the same stuff, get exactly the same benefit, exactly, except without the liability of us ever being able to lose the data. Okay? And how do we get from the situation we have today to that situation? Okay? That is the both development challenge and a research challenge, in fact. Thank you very much. We have time maybe for one question. Jim, are you, is Jim in the room? Yeah, OK. <laughs> no, I, I, the question, yes, I ask you the question. Are you in the room? Are you in the room? Good. <laughs> So, and more and more people are injecting electricity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, you're right, actually. So modern meters, and this is indeed really crucial, not only consume, but also put electricity back in the network. So they have, traditionally, they have at least two registers, the in and the out. In fact, they have four registers, because they usually have the in in the day, the in in the night, the out in the day, the out in the night. In fact, some of them then have many circuits, because you may have different circuits in your house that are even built differently, some for the heating, some for the other household appliances, so they have eight or 16. All of that is cool. We can deal with all of that, okay? Namely, what you basically do is instead of putting out one meter reading each time, you put out 16, okay? They're all independently encrypted, signed, and all that stuff. Okay, are you ready? And then the cool thing is that you can then do computations on all 16 over all, all the time, okay, and prove that, for example, it is not just that I consume that much and you should bill me, but the difference between what I injected and what I consumed was so much, and if that is positive, you should actually pay me at that tariff, but if it was negative, then you, I should pay you at a different tariff and all that stuff. And in fact, this is why, because of exactly that complexity that you described, that it's not good enough to say, we'll just send some code to the meter, it will do it because it's actually quite a sophisticated piece of code and it does change all the time because business models change because of what you describe. Yeah. Thank you. 
but it actually exactly what you say really motivates why it has to be quite so complicated and cannot just be a simple approach. Yeah. One last question. There was a question? Yes. Why can't you just make the entity too, too cheap to meet it? Uh, so this is the nuclear option, yeah? Uh, yeah, well, I don't think that humanity has reached uh, any source of electricity that, uh, you know, can be made cheap enough. I mean, nuclear energy could basically last a few tens of years, but it will run out. Uranium is not, <laughs> you know, growing on trees. Not that there are many trees growing anymore anyway. So it's, you know, I think energy, I mean, no matter what you do, I think that there will be resources that are scarce enough to actually have a market value over zero. And however, the consumption of those resources will still be privacy sensitive. You can think of electricity, gas, water, you know, buying chocolate at the supermarket. So the privacy stuff is actually not that expensive. And I, uh, to be honest, it's difficult to tell without deploying. And this is why we're running pilots, right? Uh, to understand exactly, is it the case that we need to do something really radically different? So for the billing, we have all the zero knowledge protocols and all that stuff, so that's one thing. For the aggregation, we now have very good experience of what is the cost of doing these things. And we did not have to modify the hardware of the meters in any way whatsoever. We actually used exactly the same hardware. The meter CPU is anyway being utilized at 1%. The only thing that was tight is actually the size of the code because they want to use a system on chip, so they have about 100 kilobytes of memory for code. Okay? And this is why we wanted to verify it because we have to drop our bounce checks uh, to actually fit in the memory for the, for the code segments in there. Um, the Latency and the communication protocols are unchanged. There are 32-bit values that are encrypted instead of 32-bit values that are uh, in clear. So we have not even taken a cost in terms of engineering, re-engineering all the protocols. Um, and in fact, with a student at, uh, at um, uh, UMass in Amherst, we even retrofitted all meters with this code. Uh, we took 8-bit microcontroller-based uh, MSP kind of uh, meters and retrofitted that code and it runs fine. Um, the actual crypto was designed to be extremely light on the meter and the aggregation on the servers is just an addition in exactly the same way as you would do addition otherwise because it's just that the factors in there that are added cancel <coughs> out. Okay, But you still just add 32-bit integers. So really in the case of the aggregation protocol there is no excuse based on cost. Uh, it has no patents and all that stuff. I mean, you can really take it and run with it. Uh, in the case of the zero knowledge proofs, I think the key cost that would dominate is the developer time and the expert time, because you really need, without having proper tools that automatically do the crypto for you, and these are there, I mean, we worked on those tools, but they are research grade tools. You know, I wouldn't start compiling, you know, the Windows kernel with those tools yet. Huh? Um, so I think that that's what will cost you. A cryptographer will cost you 100,000 euros a year. And that's not something that many organizations can afford. It's only very big organizations that can afford them. And that's the bottleneck, funnily enough. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.